Welcome to another episode of Critic Reading Writing. My name is Atto Quayson, and I am a professor of English at Stanford University. So far, we have deployed the concept of chronotope to interpret space in several previous episodes of Critic Reading Writing, such as those on the airport, the railway station, the Afro-Brazilians of Accra, and on urban studies more generally. Those earlier episodes were grounded on two underlying assumptions, namely, that space is a symptom and producer of social relations, and second, that it is inherently stable and thus readily knowable. These two assumptions are put under great pressure when we begin to consider examples of science fiction where space is far from stable and indeed alters in dimension at various points, sometimes unpredictably. To illustrate these different aspects of space, we are going to be looking in this episode at the films Doctor Strange, directed by Scott Derrickson, 2016, and The Matrix Reloaded, directed by the Wachowskis, 2003, in order to examine the interrelated concepts of portals and anamorphism, both of which have a major impact on how space is represented in science fiction films. We will also be referring to the movie Inception, which is directed by Christopher Nolan in 2010, to produce a variation to the ways in which the two concepts appear in the two other films. Together, these films will help us to get a good working sense of the different geometries of space and time in science fiction. One feature shared by both Doctor Strange and The Matrix Reloaded is the frequent and explicit passage through portals of different kinds in order to access different spaces. In the genres of science fiction and fantasy, portals typically act as gateways into different dimensions of space and time. However, all portals are not the same. In her introduction to the volume Rhetorics of Fantasy, Farah Mendelssohn provides a handy description of the four types of fantasy and science fiction, all of which require specific modes of entry, exit, and inhabitation, and also have different textures of space and time. Three of her categories are especially useful to our discussion today. We must note that Mendelssohn's taxonomy suggests various degrees of overlap among the categories she describes, and we shall see these overlaps also in relation to the films we will be discussing. The different types of science fiction and fantasy Mendelssohn describes include 1. Portal Fantasy Quest the Portal Fantasy Quest is simply a fantastic world that is entered through a portal or gateway. Examples include The Lion, The Witch and the Wardrobe, Alice in Wonderland, The Lord of the Rings, and Amos Tutola's My Life in the Bush of Ghosts, among many others. These are almost always quests that proceed in a linear fashion, 
and with a goal that must be met. Furthermore, as Mendelssohn points out, like the computer games they have spawned, they often contain elaborate descriptive elements. In essence, portal quest fantasies require navigation rather than conquest and are about entry, transition, and negotiation. Two, immersive fantasy. In contrast to the portal quest fantasy, the immersive fantasy assumes a world in which the fantastic elements are completely normal and require little or no explanation. This is typically the world of science fiction, except that in many science fiction novels and films, the reader or viewer is often introduced to the scientific logic behind some of the technology found in them. This is sometimes done by way of an internal explanatory mechanism by which a more knowledgeable character explains how something works to another character either as a means toward greater efficiency or simply as a way of introducing the other character or indeed characters to things they might not know. The overall effectiveness of immersive fantasy and science fiction is their dependence on the assumption of the complete realism of their worlds, such as to disavow the requirement for complete explication. And as a general rule, the characters do not actually have to enter into the immersive fantasy, but are simply assumed to be already part of it. Nothing in the immersive fantasy world is a surprise to them, and everything, no matter how seemingly extraordinary, from the point of view of the world in which the reader or viewer is looking at the immersive fantasy, is considered completely normal. Examples of immersive fantasies include uh, China Meville's Perdido Street Station and Lauren Buex's Zoo City, both of which also happen to be multi-generic and rule-bending texts that turn primarily on immersing the reader in a world that is consistent in its overall fantastic elements. We should also note that this description of immersive fantasy can also encompass magical realist texts such as Gabriel Garcia Marquez's 100 Years of Solitude and Toni Morrison's Beloved, among various others. We will dedicate a specific set of episodes of critic reading writing to magical realism in a few weeks' time. So we'll not delve into uh, magical realism uh, right now. Three, intrusion fantasy. Farah Mendelssohn describes intrusion fantasy simply as the bringer of chaos and that it is the beast in the bottom of the garden or the elf seeking assistance. In intrusive fantasy, the foundational basis of fantasy and reality are kept strictly separate, with the protagonist sometimes having to move between the two worlds and trying to keep the knowledge of the interrelationship between the two as a secret not to be readily shared with others who are likely to be skeptical. 
the fantastic may also act as an intrusion into the real and under particular conditions may ebb and flow in and out of the text. The film Pan's Labyrinth is a good example of intrusive fantasy, as is Ben Okri's The Famished Road, both of which will be compared in the later episodes of critic reading writing I just referred to. Both Doctor Strange and The Matrix Reloaded can be described under the category of immersive science fiction, but with many explicit and repeated portals between worlds, along with many explanations for the quests that are being undertaken. Both films present parables of self-discovery tied to quests, such that the navigation of the fantastical and or scientific domains in search of a villain or the resolution of a crisis to save mankind are also closely aligned to the resolution of an identity crisis for the central character. This is what we see in the cases of both Neo in the Matrix series and in that, in that of Dr. Stephen Strange but their pathways to self-discovery are completely different. Whereas Stephen Strange is required to learn humility in order to access the bountiful resources that are made available to him through self-discipline and the spiritual disavowal of the self, in Neo's case, he's required to shed his natural diffidence and believe that he is the one who has to unlock his true potential so as to be able to act as a barely disguised Christ figure who will save the world from the control of the matrix system. Additionally, Neo has to save the rebellious enclave of Zion, which is his home base, from the attempts at their destruction launched regularly from the Matrix. The two heroes also cross different space-time zones and face challenges of both a physical and interpretative nature, with the Matrix series being the far more enigmatic and philosophical of the two. The concept of anamorphism also defines the textures of space-time in both films. In science fiction and fantasy, anamorphism simply means the distortion of form. Typically, in science fiction, anamorphism is most readily seen in the distortions of space-time coordinates, such that an innocent-looking door in a bedroom will be opened only to reveal the entire twinkling galaxy. Closed and opened again, it might reveal a bustling street in Paris. And if closed and opened again, only the cat yawning under a leafy mango tree in the backyard. The point is that space and time are not entirely predictable and that there are wrinkles in space-time that either lead to the unpredictable connections between different dimensions or, as is also common, the different texturizations of space and time. Time might become viscous or take on a form of sudden sentience this is, for example, what we see in Amos Tutuola's My Life in the Bush of Ghosts. At one point, the central character is running away from ghosts who are in hot pursuit. He enters a patch of the bush, only to discover, as he steps onto it, 
that it begins to scream in pain, thus giving away his location to his pursuers. This continues throughout his desperate escape across this sentient landscape. In this particular case, Tutola is illustrating the idea of interspecies sentience and ontologies, so that the earth seems to be taking on the character's own embodied terror and enacting it on both their behalves. A good example of space-time viscosity is to be found in the Matrix Reloaded when Trinity falls out of a skyscraper window as she fights with one of the uh, bespectacled avatars of Mr. Smith toward the end of the movie. He follows her through the window and shoots at her with a gun he's holding in his hand. Trinity falls facing him and is also shooting at him while she falls. However, they both fall in slow motion. One of his bullets defines a viscous pathway through space as it leaves his gun, as though traveling through some thick fluid until, still in slow motion, it hits Trinity in the heart. At another point in the movie, Neo flies at supersonic speed to reach Trinity. He flies so fast that this creates a vortex behind him that has his flight path sucking up items from below him, including entire cars and in even parts of buildings. This gives him a tale of urban debris as he flies. Both of these episodes illustrate the anamorphism of space. However, one thing we must note in both instances is that even though space and time have clearly morphed away from the ordinary, this morphing somehow does not affect the physical constitution of the characters themselves. They do not, for example, become elongated or melted or somehow altered in their bodily structure as they traverse these anamorphized spaces. The portal effect of both The Matrix and Doctor Strange requires some attention as they are fundamental to the nature of the immersive structures they illustrate. In both movies, portals are repeatedly signaled for the entry and exit into and out of different worlds. Thus, in The Matrix, whenever Neo and his collaborators want to move from Zion into The Matrix, they lie on couches in a special room inside the enclave of Zion, and each has a tube attached to the back of their heads, after which they are uploaded to a computer as a series of AI algorithms so that they can be rematerialized up in the world controlled by the matrix. This other world is one that looks exactly like our own real world. It seems entirely realistic, except that we have repeatedly been told that it is under the regulation of the matrix, as though it were a dream. However, whenever Neo and the others from Zion seek a return to safety back home, they are required to find a telephone that will ring and that on being picked up will immediately transport them back to Zion. This leads to a lot of tension in the movie. These portals of entry and exit are made clearly evident in the entire range of the three-part Matrix series. However, in addition to these explicit portals, 
Neo is also presented with peculiar mind-bending enigmas and puzzles, the solution of which act as a key for passage to another special installment on his path to self-discovery, and thus the ultimate defeat of the Matrix. There are several of these enigmatic moments, but perhaps the most significant is the one in The Matrix Reloaded when he finally comes face to face with the white-haired creator of The Matrix in a room surrounded by dozens of monitors on every wall and in, on each one of which is reflected a live image of different periods of Neo's own life, including the one in which he's talking to the Matrix creator against the background of the monitors. The enigma that the creator presents him with this time is whether it is better to live by the code of love, the proof of which would be exiting through a particular door to go and save Trinity and thus fail like other savior figures before him or to compromise and go back and save all of Zion which is under imminent attack as they speak. Neo chooses love and flies off to save Trinity. But this choice tends out to unleash even greater powers within him because the choice of amorous love also unlocks features of divine love, which include that of creation and of healing. Thus, Neo is able to reincarnate Trinity back to life by putting his digitized algorithmic hand into her heart and removing the bullet that had fatally hit her in the viscous scene we alluded to earlier. The portals in Doctor Strange are somewhat more straightforward and do not require the solution to any particular puzzles and enigmas. Also, once Stephen Strange learns the required humility, he is able to create portals at will by use of the special ring he wears on his right hand and with which he is able to create flaming circles that can transport him to wherever he wants to be. There is, however, one critical scene in the movie that requires our extra attention because of the ways in which it illustrates the principles of folding time space as manifest through an explicit set of geometric figurations in the movie. The scene I have in mind here takes place between 1 hour 19 minutes and 18 seconds to 1 hour 21 minutes and 54 seconds. The location is New York and Dr. Strange and Mordo are being hotly pursued by the villain Kaecilus and his henchmen. Kaecilus happens to have absorbed phenomenal powers from the dark dimension. As they run, Dr. Strange creates a fiery ring portal through which they attempt to escape pursuit. But Kaecilus, not to be outdone, deploys his own form of conjuration to split up the skyline and to distort the buildings into duplicates of each other, as well as making some of them lateral rather than vertical in a series of mixed geometrical uh, arrangements. As the chase continues, Kaecilus conjures up another trick, this time to convert the entire cityscape into the interior of a machine with moving pieces full of hard edges and angles that Strange and Mordo now have to navigate. This phase of the action suggests that the city 
is a machine like entity and that Mordo and Strange have entered its deepest entrails. But these sharp angles and machine like edges then give way quickly to another set of geometric principles when the ancient one played by the inimitable Tilda Swinton appears in the scene to help Strange and Mordo. On her appearance, the scene converts to them standing on a beautiful tapestry of interlinked ovals and circles, as if inside an ancient monastery. More importantly, surrounding them and moving in a steady and slow secular fashion are a series of kaleidoscopic geometrical shapes. Thus, we have in one short sequence moved through different geometric representations of space-time, the machinic, the circular, and the kaleidoscopic. The effect of these rapid alterations is to convey space as essentially a matter of geometric figures that are nonetheless rapidly oscillating and morphing in response to the hectic unfolding of the action taking place at the foreground. While the scene is definitely anamorphic, it is so in a specifically geometric set of procedures. The idea of geometry is a persistent feature of Doctor Strange because even though it is essentially a fantasy movie in contrast to say Iron Man which is a science uh, fiction movie it persistently connects the spiritual world to that of scientific reasoning. This is entirely appropriate given that Dr. Stephen Strange was a, originally a renowned neurosurgeon who lost the use of his hands when his car spun out of control and got into a terrible mangle of a bridge. It is this initial crisis that sets him off on a quest to find healing for his hands, but that lead him to the monastery in Kathmandu and from where he learns humility and earns his powers. In terms of portals and anamorphism, Inception is quite different from both Doctor Strange and The Matrix. The film is about industrial espionage, but turns on the motif of planting ideas inside someone's subconscious by way of their dreams. Hence the concept of Inception that we find illustrated in the movie. However, there are several levels of complication to this basic idea. The process of inception assumes that there are dreams within dreams and that to plant an idea in the subconscious properly, it has to be done at the deepest dream level. This is then what the bulk of the movie is devoted to illustrating. The other thing about the inception is that the, it's conducted around teen dreaming, where several people are brought together into one person's dream and are assigned different rules within that dream. To complicate matters even further, the dream guests may also populate the dream host's dream with projections from their own memories. These projections may interact with the dreamscape of the host at different levels and interfere with the plans for inception. The host may also have internal defense mechanisms that manifest themselves as militarized personnel who shoot down or otherwise block the 
intruding inception team. What is most pertinent to our discussion, however, is that apart from the initial motif of linking all dream participants together through a special dream contraption carried in a suitcase, the switch between different levels of the dream is accomplished without explicit references to portals or gateways. In the critical part of the movie, when the Inception team is inside of Mr. Fletcher's dream uh, to plant the business idea in his mind, they also create different hosts to dream three other dreams inside of Fletcher's own dream, and in which all the team members and Mr. Fletcher also appear to interact with him within different landscapes. Crucially, the switch between dream levels is not cued by way of a passage or portal. Sometimes the team members refer to what is happening on the other levels of the dreams, but the switches are done without a direct reference to either the entry or exit through portals. This essential obliteration of portals is designed to install the idea for us viewers of the undecidability between what is real and what is a dream, thus also obscuring the difference between appearance and reality. The other important difference between Inception and the other two movies we have been discussing is that anamorphism appears mainly in terms of the slowing down of time within some of the dreams, while at the other levels, the timescape seems to be proceeding completely normally. From time to time, there's also the geometrical folding of space, quite similar to what we saw in Doctor Strange but never are these wrinklings of space meant to act as the sign of imminent portals. Science fiction and fantasy force us to take account of space and its texture and the dimensions and ways that we are not obliged to in realist fiction and film. What remains to be answered is whether their deployment of space has specific implications for how we understand social relations. In other words, is space in science fiction both a symptom and producer of social relations, or is it simply a background of anamorphism? The answer to this question lies in whether the characters see anamorphic space and experience it as a problem that requires special forms of navigation and engagement or not. This is particularly evident in the Matrix, where at all times different spaces are used to pose questions to the central characters. This determines how they interact with one another, and indeed how they understand their adversaries. When Neo confronts Mr. Smith in the scene where Neo goes to meet the female oracle, he and Mr. Smith exchange words as they fight. But the words that they exchange pertain to their contrasting interpretations of their positions in space and the implications of these. Additionally, Mr. Smith multiplies himself several fold as he fights with Neo. A more sophisticated preamble to these interpretations have already been provided by the Oracle, who gives Neo some lessons regarding the workings of the matrix and how the people and entities that have eluded it 
become an amorphic object in space, such as the birds that peck at their feet as they speak. This lesson is important because it requires that Neo pay attention to everything inside of any given space he traverses. The requirement of hyper-attentiveness also means that space acquires a certain vitality that transcends the human capacity for either complete comprehension or indeed control, giving space an ontology distinct from that of humans. Thank you very much. Please remember to check the suggested readings in the episode description. And if you like this episode, give the thumbs up, subscribe and share, hit the notifications bell so that you do not miss any forthcoming episodes and enter your comments in the section below. See you next week.